The following is an extended product spotlight paid for by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Hey everyone, I'm Sean Haney and I'm here to welcome you to the next episode of the Canola Podcast sponsored by Invigor Hybrid Canola from BSF. The Canola Podcast is a podcast series that will be highlighting useful tips and tools growers can take to the field to help them create successful crops. Today we're looking at the top 10 steps to seasonal success and we'll take you through the 10 steps you can take to ensure you're unlocking the full yield potential of canola hybrids in your fields next season. Today I'm joined by two BSF experts who are very familiar with success in canola crops. Can you guys introduce yourself and walk us through what today is going to be all about? Sean, you first. Yeah, I'm Sean McKnight. I'm a tech service specialist um, based in southern Saskatchewan. So I've been with uh, BSF for Almost 10 years, I started with a research team and, and spent some time with sales, and I've been with Tech Service since uh, 2017, so looking forward to, to talking about canola production today. Great. And I'm Wade Stalker. I'm the Season Traits Operation Manager with BSF, and um, yeah, I started working with Invigor in 2004, so I've been around for a long time. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to work in several different positions um, with Invigor in Canada and Europe, and uh, touched many things like breeding, production, product development, marketing, now operations. So nice nice to talk to everybody today. Yeah, it's great to have both of you here. Now, this episode is all about walking a grower through the steps they can take to have a successful season. But there are so many things that contribute to success every single year. So, Sean, let's start with you. What are some of those things that you need to do to make sure you're establishing success? I mean, for me, the the obvious place to start would be finding the right hybrids, obviously, that fits your, your farm. So, you know, we know every, every farm has different needs, and there really is a lot of information available. So I think, you know, the first steps are really just taking a, a look at what's most important to you and, and what your practices are that, that really could influence what hybrids you choose. So, you know, important things to consider could be, you know, what your growing season length is, which which really would, would make you target certain maturities. Other considerations could be specific disease concerns like uh, clubbert or black leg. Um, you know, perhaps you're applying manure or you have land under irrigation, which would make standability even that much more important. You know, also looking for flexibility at harvest time could really drive you to consider a pod shatter reduction hybrid. So, you know, really those are just a few things to think about when selecting your, your hybrids and, and getting ready for, for next year. Um, when it comes to you know, actually choosing the hybrids, of course, you know, we have a number of hybrids to choose from. And I really do believe there's, there's a, you know, an invigor hybrid for all Western Canadian growers, but, you know, it really can be, can be tricky to make that decision. So, you know, to help make it a little easier, we do have a hybrid selection tool on the BSF website. And this kind of walks you through a few questions and asks you about some specific needs you may have. And this can, you know, hopefully help you make that, uh, that first crucial decision. And don't don't forget also that um, encourage everybody to check out InvigorResults.ca where there's lots of local yield trials. Um, you can dig in a little bit deeper and see some of the the uh, you know in depth data and really isolate out the hybrid performance. So encourage everybody to visit InvigorResults.ca as well. When growers go to InvigorResults.ca, can they find competitor information as well, or is it only Invigor Results? Uh, no, absolutely. In the trials, we look at competitive hybrids as well. So, you know, I think our DS program is, is, is really a crew, a cool program that we run with growers. You know, we use their, their equipment really on their farm. So, you know, we, we replicate, replicate these trials and they're done at a local level by our tech service team. And, you know, they include our hybrids as well as competitors. So win, lose or draw, they're all posted on the website. And I, you know, I really encourage people to, to check back frequently throughout the fall as, as more results become available. Yield is is one characteristic of a hybrid, although you know it is very very important. But what else should growers be looking for when they're trying to select a hybrid? Yeah, that really ties into what Sean mentioned earlier, and um, and what hybrid traits will suit your farm needs. So, for example, what herbicide tolerance is important? Um, what's your harvest plan? Are you looking for flexibility? Uh, do you want a straight cut or or swath it or delay swath it? Then maybe you know pod shadow reduction is important. Of course, black leg is a growing concern, as is club root, and you know need to consider whether club root's popping up in your area. There's really a number of things here. So you you mentioned club root. Let's let's maybe talk a little bit more about that. What do growers need to think about when selecting hybrids with club root resistance? 
Yeah, club route is a complicated issue, right? And so, um, and it's not necessarily just simple, you know, check in the box, I have club route resistance and go forward. There's a little bit more to it, uh, I suspect, as everybody knows. So um, to help with that, you know, there is a club route decision matrix that we have available on our website that hopefully can help growers make that decision on when they need resistance and whether they need first or second generation uh, resistance. Um, just generally speaking, however, we would recommend growers start with first generation club root resistance. You know, when they're starting to think about club root could be an issue or, or there's a growing concern, start with the first generation club root resistance um, before switching to second. So after you've grown first generation for a few cycles and you're scouting, that's really important, making sure that, that uh, everybody is out there scouting for club root. And perhaps, uh, perhaps you're witnessing a little bit of um, resistance breakdown in your first generation hybrids, or you've grown a few cycles of them. Then as the decision matrix will tell you, it's now time to maybe think about switching to that second generation um, club root resistance for a few cycles. Well, we've hit on club root. There's also black leg. What should growers consider in terms of black leg? Yeah, first, first and foremost, um, you know, all all in bigger hybrids anyway are rated R for resistance to black leg. Um, but like so many diseases, it's important that we utilize good integration pest management plan or practices. And specifically for black leg, these include, um, you know, one, utilizing the newest R rated hybrids, scouting regularly, managing the susceptible weeds, such as the other brassicas or volunteers that might be present. Utilizing a registered fungicide at the proper timing, that could be an option also. Um, and of course, now we're seeing more, um, you know, there's some seed treatments becoming available that offer and help to protect against airborne, um, airborne black leg. And really, really these uh, seed treatments can complement the hybrid resistance uh, quite nicely. And then of course, where possible, um, extend the rotation. Yeah, I think also building on that that weight, it's it's also important to to consider integrated pest management outside of black leg as well. So, you know, obviously you covered earlier scouting is important, and you know myself, I really can't stress that enough. Um, you know, it's really the most important part of your integrated pest management plan. Um, you know, for example, if you found clubbird on your farm while you're scouting, um, you know, it's important to have a plan to execute. So, you know, you could enjoy it and you know employ a a patch management strategy to help mitigate the spread. Um, other things to think about would be, you know, sanitation practices to limit soil and maybe perhaps herbicide resistant seed movement across your farm. You know, also controlling those canola volunteers or, or other brassica weeds that could really act as hosts for diseases. And then finally, utilizing hybrid genetics and, and really the whole registered portfolio of pesticide products to control weeds, diseases, and insects, kind of like Wade had mentioned as well. And then kind of the last point, here is is really also extending your canola rotations to you know a minimum of once every three years where possible yeah so on on the rotation front we we hear often when people talk about ipm it it involves extending rotations there's also a financial component to this too Do, do you think extension of the rotation is a fair request Wade? yeah i mean i mean obviously extending rotations is ideal um but is a fair request that's a great question because there are, there are a lot of things that uh, a grower needs to consider. And of course, the final, financial implications um, often becomes first and foremost. So, I mean, I think what's important is that everybody understands that genetics are not the be all and end all for solving all problems, right? And, and so when financial decisions are made to shorten rotations, it comes with some risk. Um, and there are certain things that growers can do to mitigate that risk. But um, with some diseases, particularly club root, which can be um, particularly problematic, breeders are always chasing this disease. And so what that means is that, is that um, as they look for uh, more and more sources of resistance, they're going to further and further sources, genetically further and further sources. And to bring that resistance in, often they're also bringing in some things that are, are not so beneficial, like penalties to yield or to maturity, uh, quality, and so on. So this is just some of the things that we need to remember um, when we are shortening resistance, that we are putting a lot of pressure on breeders and the genetics um, to, to help solve that. So we need to do other things as well. Yeah, one relatively easy practice for growers pushing the rotation is, is you know, ensure they do a good job of controlling volunteers, for example. So, you know, I think this is key to, 
really ensuring there aren't any unwanted hosts for for those diseases or or even out of plants really that can affect plant population you know which can lead to increased lodging and really negatively affect the, the yield potential of the hybrid plant at the end of the day so depending on your rotation these volunteers could you know also have different herbicide resistance profiles and maybe a resistance here in crop herbicide so um, you know, our, our pod chatter hybrids too, they can really help min- minimize that risk in terms of, of, you know, there's less risk of that seed becoming a volunteer. Okay, let's get back to maturity. Can all hybrids be grown anywhere or are there regional limitations or considerations when selecting a hybrid? Well, I think first off, it's it's really important to note that typically there there is a linear relationship between yield potential and a longer maturing hybrid. So, in a way, it, it, it really becomes a, a balance between kind of those two factors. So, you know, obviously maturity becomes an important consideration. And, and of course, there are, you know, significant variations between hybrids and, and how quickly they mature. So another thing that complicates the issue, too, is that, you know, dependent on the region, the year, and, and, and of course, the weather, this can, you know, impact the maturity. But, you know, with all that said, growers who are in short season zones or you know, really are concerned with getting their, their crop off, you know, they should, of course, target early maturing hybrids. And, um, you know, our maturity scale is, is based on our hybrids and, and how they compare to one another. So the scale itself is not, you know, an absolute, but it's a, a great guide when considering what hybrid fits your, your operation. So, you know, InvigorResults.ca is also a good tool for, for understanding the maturity differences between different hybrids in, in your area. Hey, guys, any other considerations? Plant population, I think, is an important one that's worth uh, considering. So, lots of research has, uh, you know, lots of research has been done now showing that targeting five to seven plants per square foot really goes a long ways in ensuring the best performance and yield. So, you know, some of those benefits of that targeted plant population are, uh, of course, reducing intra-crop competition, so we aren't seeding and creating our own weeds better use of resources in terms of moisture and, you know, better light penetration, better nutrition utilization. Um, all these things, you know, they go a long ways in increasing yield, um, partially due to better standability, um, which, of course, has other implications like lower, lower incidence of sclerotinia, for example, because you're not trapped in all the moisture and um, in the crop and you can get a little bit of airflow and light penetration. You know, the other thing we actually see, which is interesting coming out of the year that we just observed is um, we see elevated stress tolerance. So in years where we have drought or conditions where you have drought, the ideal plant population, you know, there's five to seven plants per square foot. Um, it certainly helps with that. And I think of what's going on there, as you can imagine, what's happening above the ground is also happening below the ground. So, you know, just being able to cope with, uh, with that moisture, maybe, maybe send down that taproot and reach that moisture a little bit more efficiently and then um and then of course you know just there's more uniform maturity and better plant structure and generally so there's a lot of things it's easier getting to achieve this too i mean <clears throat> one of the great things with uh invigor rate the launch of invigor rate is it's really you know making it a lot simpler for growers to achieve five to seven plants per square foot and you know it's clearly labeled on the bag you just have to follow that recommendation and you're going to be pretty close in most most situations. I think it's also worth mentioning that, um, you know, for anybody that's worried about flea beetles, having lumiderm on your invigor, you know, making sure that you have that as well is the best approach. It's going to give you the best chance off, off the beginning. Feels like we've covered a lot of ground here. There's a lot of agronomic information to digest. <laughs> well, I think the last piece isn't really that groundbreaking and, and probably won't change anytime soon. I think a, a little bit of luck with the weather definitely goes a, a long way as well. Yeah, no kidding. We need Mother Nature to cooperate uh, to boost those yields up <laughs> on the 22 crop. Really, there's a lot of steps to a successful season. We've rolled it all out today in this podcast. Thanks again for joining us, guys. It's been a blast to hear more about how Invigor keeps growing. Cheers. Thanks, Sean.